Um, we have three uh, great presentations. We purposely coordinated these presentations um, with work that uh, was done with the Bay Modeling Program and some advancements that are made with that. Uh, gentlemen are going to tell you about that immediately. And um, several months ago, probably late last fall, we decided that it would be a great uh, opportunity to try to put some of these together, lay some foundation, and tell you a couple examples of panel work that was done. So with that being said, I will let uh, Jeremy Hansen and Mark Gubin uh, step up, and they're going to tag team on our first presentation and uh, fill you in with their own resumes and information. Thanks. So I'm Jeremy Hansen. I work for Virginia Tech. But like Mark and like Kelly, I work at the Chesapeake Bay Program Office in Annapolis, Maryland. Um, and we'll be talking a little bit about that as well today. I've been at the Bay Program myself for nearly five years now, a couple different capacities. Uh, Mark, introduce yourself. Sure. <coughs> Mark Gibbon, University of Maryland Extension at the College Park. And uh, I've been at the Extension at the Bay Program Office for a decade now. There's no wonder if you uh, but uh, before that, I uh, worked in uh, Pennsylvania, which is a big program up there for, uh, for a number of years, for the 13 years up there, and then also had uh, practical farm experience with farm operations in shore and up in Pennsylvania. Thanks, Mark. So I'm going to start us off here, and Mark will take over about halfway through. All right, so just to recap, I mean, Kelly Ted touched on this a lot this morning. Uh, the Bay Watershed is 64,000 square miles in size. About 18 million people that now still grows about 100,000 people per year. I think it's great. Um, and it's got a 14 to 1 land to water ratio, which I think is the highest in the world for an estuary. And that just uh, reiterates the point that what happens on the land really matters in terms of water quality. So when we're talking about restoring the bay, we have to talk about the management practices on the ground in the watershed. The Bay Program itself uh, is a partnership composed of, composed of federal, state, local partners, as well as academics, uh, land grant universities, and non governmental entities, and people who care about the Bay and want to restore it and deal with a lot of different projects or focused areas, not just water quality. Um, but today's focus, we're talking most about in terms of water quality, silo, nutrients, and sediment. And as I said this morning, uh, the Bay Program has been together for over 30 years. First got together back in 83 when Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia, <coughs> District of Columbia, and the federal government got together and signed the first Bay Agreement. And then it was formed under law and under the Clean Water Act as a regional office within the EPA, Region 3 and been doing a lot of work since then. Try that. All right. Yeah. But <laughs> we have a little more of an agricultural focus, obviously, waste for work context. Um, but over 80,000 operations in the farms, uh, over eight and a half million acres of that field of cropland, uh, over three million animal units. Uh, the map up there is looking at all animal types in terms of animal units. Uh, it's screen grabbed from ISOL data visualization tool that I put together to help our partners as they're doing what we're calling the phase six watershed model and go in there and view animal populations and some other input data, get a sense of you know, what does it look like if I want to look at different animal types, different years. Um, it's nice and graphical. So this is like a 2012 map, so just based on that census data, you can see that uh, the Shenandoah Valley, southern, southeastern Pennsylvania, and the Marva are obviously a pretty hot spots in terms, of, in terms of animal production. And that's a lot of manure. I think 40 million tons. I'm not sure yeah, I think that's from a particle you can find in the other. It's a lot of manure. <clears throat> Baking the L, and this is kind of the driver for a lot of the work, or for all the panels that we do. Um, like Kelly said this morning, it was promulgated or published back in 2010. And we're not going to talk a lot about the policy, but just by way of background, you know, it's been around since 2010 for 92 title segments in 
terms of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment loads. Um, and the goal for that is by 2025 to have all carcasses in place to meet the total maximum daily load of you know, that diet uh, that can meet the water quality standards for the Chesapeake Bay. And then by 2017, uh, the goal is to have 60% of those reductions. So this next time around when EPA and the states are working on their evaluation of the progress, uh, the goal is to meet the 60% target. Uh, the idea was to be some lower hanging fruit in the early years. Uh, and along the way, there's two new milestones. So 2017, 2019, 2021. That way, there's just kind of check ins to see between so the EPA and the states and say, okay, this is falling maybe a little bit behind in this area or that area. Um, so it's unlike previous attempts that were more voluntary based on the agreements of, hey, we're going to clean up the way by 2000 or 2010. Now there's much, much more developed accountability. <coughs> and just for perspective purposes, I'm not going to walk you through the whole org chart here, um, but you can get a sense of just how complex the overall Bay program really is working in uh, areas like fisheries, water quality, healthy watersheds, um, you have advisory committees, um, you have your secretary level and governor level uh, folks up there, and trickles all the way down to folks like me who work mostly the work group level, um, the goal implementation team level to do all the tasks and work the model to figure out, okay, how much uh, reduction of credit should we get for you know, the X or Y, um, how much manure does it should we create, and all these different efforts that eventually get plugged into the partnerships efforts to track progress towards the TMDA. And um, if you can guess, you know, which one of these water quality goal and meditation teams is the busiest, things pretty clear. <laughs> which one tends to be the most often and have the most agenda items, especially in recent years uh, with that midpoint assessment, 2017 midpoint assessment we talked about. There's been a lot of work leading up to this year in terms of figuring out ways to improve the model from the previous version up to the phase six version. Um, in terms of land use inputs, EMP uh, estimates, everything, more or less everything is on the table. So again, the, what we call the phase five watershed model is what has been in use since 2010, when the TMDL first came out. Um, and since then, there's really, basically as soon as that came out, there was a wish list of things to already do for the next version. And so that's why uh, we've been working since then towards the phase six model, making improvements to it um, so that jurisdictions and work on their next version of the watershed implementation to plans or WIPs, uh, what we're calling phase three WIPs. Sorry if all the different phases are confusing. <laughs> I know it can be, but this is uh, a reflection of the world that the Bay Program works in. We've got our own language, an additional language of each of our partners. Uh, and really that illustration is just the most, that's the most simplistic level how does the phase six model work? Uh, it all starts, you know, what's what's coming off the land? How do the BMPs change that? Um, what's good, what's getting to the water? What's getting to the streams? What's getting to the rivers? And ultimately, what ends up in the bay? This all kind of comes together and ultimately goes into the water quality model of the estuary itself to determine, okay, how we're on track. We're meeting water quality standards yet. And like Kelly noted this morning, there are a lot of encouraging trends in the mo monitoring data. Um, the model itself is calibrated to over 30 years of monitoring data um, and the historical record of all these inputs. You know, it's not just the most recent 10 years we, have, we use data that goes all the way back to the early 80s. And really, we're talking mostly about today is just, okay, just the BMPs, you know, like what's, 
what's their effect overall? Uh, the states tell us every year you know, how much implementation it did of all the different practices, whether it's bringing from urban to agriculture. And all ends up going to the bottom. And that, Mark. So, you know, folks talk about feeding the model, and uh, we're going to talk about some of the different areas that, uh, that that's part of. And one of those we're going to talk about first is looking at the model data inputs. So these are the, uh, this is the information we're going to look at sort of building the structure of the model. How many animals do we have out there in worship, different species? How much are their nutrients are they generated? Uh, what's the crop plan production out there across the worship? How, many, how much nutrients are they uptaking as far as production of life? So a lot of basic information that we're working with, we're looking at to start the equation, to start the process of figuring out where we are, where we're going for the future for water quality. So, so for agriculture, some of the, uh, the main items we're going to be using from is from the, uh, traditionally from the primary access is from mass. Uh, we'll look at that as far as crop production, livestock production across there. That's important for us to find your access because it's typically reported at a county scale, which is the base scale that we normally work with in agriculture for uh, oak and mala. And it's also very detailed. So we get a full representation across all different types of production, even from the very small uh, beets all the way up to uh, corn and soybeans. So that's important for us. Another aspect that we're looking at here for, for what we're doing here with phase six, looking at fertilizer sales from Africa. So we're looking at the point of sale of uh, how many tons of fertilizer are being sold out there across the watershed for agricultural use. That goes in the equation along with the livestock nutrient generation. That's forming up some of the basics of nutrients that are going to be used and where they're going to be applied, how they're going to be taken up and utilized in agricultural production. So as far as where we're, where we're moving to, towards, and we're making steps towards that here right uh, the past year or so. We've been looking at where do we get our information from for those basic model inputs. Because having the right numbers to begin the equation is very important. You just can't have numbers and add a BMP to it and expect to come out with the right answer. You have to have good information in at the beginning. So we're looking at it and we're saying, can we do better than the five year access? Because again, it comes out every five years, right? So what do you do all the four years in between? You don't have data for You have to basically draw a line between access and shears. So that doesn't really reflect the fluctuation you might see from your year of production across, uh, across agricultural systems in a six to eight region. Uh, so we're looking at that so we can utilize perhaps agricultural uh, mass information on an annual basis. That's right at a state level, but not a county. You get to decide how you distribute that information down to its scale scale. Because these worship based systems are not based on local value. So roughly about half of its millions of the bay worship and the other half stop. So you have to divide that data out and make it appropriate. Uh, so looking at that looking at crop production data, looking at livestock production data, uh, the mass of uh, the five year access relies on voluntary contributions of, of data inputs from producers. So they get copies of the uh, census report in the mail. I have to fill them out myself, and a lot of folks maybe don't have the time or interest to send them back in. Uh, so how accurate is that? The other aspect we look at with the five-year census is that there's only a handful of operations in the county, say maybe it's a, a egg-laying operation, they will not be reported because of the congressional requirement that not disclose private information. So that information never shows up in the county scale only in the state. So it leaves us sort of a gap, a hole about how many, uh, what's the population of different species of livestock are in certain counties. And so you can miss some very important information from the access that way. Uh, that also, yeah, this will show up with annual information because that's only in the state level. So issues there. Fertilizer information. So moving towards the after data is very, very much a positive step in the right direction for us. But it has limitations as well because it's only reported at the point of sale. So an individual point of sale can be serviced in multiple counties and multiple states. How do we know where the fertilizer went? Which counties they went to and for what uses? So there's information there we're looking at how we can do a better job. Mineral nutrient generation. 
we're talking a little bit more about that, but that's really going back and saying, hey, rather than using a national average book value, or like a <coughs> study or a uh, university uh, study looking at these crucial nutrients from the back end of an animal, that may not be reflective of changes that's going on within the industries we see in the Chesapeake Bay region. For example, one of the, one of the points that was brought up here one of the sessions earlier today was looking at the differences of poultry uh, broader weights, harvest weights, you're looking at you know, uh, a heavier weight bird on the eastern shore than you're looking at West Virginia that's a can three pound bird because they have a different contract for raising those birds. So a, a bird that's half the weight is going to have a very different their generation, future generation with that. So that's the information we're never going to get from a national average. And so going out there and getting information about those different populations is important to us. And looking at nutrient transportation. So the, those nutrients are not all going on the farm where it was raised. Some of those operations are the land operations. They're going to transport maybe 100% of their nutrients off farm. Uh, so we're going to go into alternate uses for mushroom uh, facilities up in Pennsylvania, for instance. Or maybe we're going to be going to uh, um, facilities that are making uh, materials for urban land use. Uh, fertilization. So we need to basically be able to track this as well. So what we typically have in the past here, we look at nutrient generation and we look at basically estimating what volatilization might be. We're looking at storage and handling losses for the facility, et cetera, on that. It's part of those things where we'll be calculating from those estimated national average values. So there's a lot here that might be an error there. So we're looking at basically by generating our own information for livestock nutrient generation, by going out there working with integrated businesses, we're doing surveys with producers and growers, pulling nutrient samples from stockpiles, and assembling that information, we can get a better handle perhaps the differences we might see in different populations across the region. And so then we can basically look at looking at information directly from the nutrients generated from facilities, directly from the stockpiles and storage units, for those, those, op, those populations and operations. And that can have fluctuations over time. You might see operations that maybe are uh, stockpiling uh, their, uh, their uh, dry litter within their border houses that are refined in the versus any cleanouts. That has That's a huge effect upon what the ancient generation might be. So as far as that's so one aspect we're looking at for information going to the beginning of the equation for, for doing some our model estimations, Another important aspect are the BMPs, the practices that we're using in implementing on landscape to control losses of nutrients and sediments uh, within the watershed. And this can take a lot of different forms of what their activities may be. It can be as far as looking at a land conversion practice. So we're taking a field of production, we're putting it into a prep program, for instance, planting the trees, or going into, into non harvested grasses. We might look at load filtration practices. Taking a stream a repairing area in the pasture, fencing it off and creating a, a forested or, or grass repairing buffer. It's filtering out nutrients and sediment coming into that stream from the, from the uh, landscape around it. Looking at nutrient application practices, nutrient management planning systems, looking at adjusting rates of application to better match plant needs through information such as uh, yield harvest maps, looking at better soil, soil testing analysis across these fields. Nutrient source reduction practices. We do things like using fine taste to better match feeds, livestock feeds, with nutrient needs of, this, of the livestock. So we have less inert nutrients to deal with afterwards. We heard a little bit about, about that from one of the other speakers earlier this morning. And nutrient transformation practices. When we take those nutrients and convert them to other, other forms, energy forms, Forms that can be better transported or reused for other purposes. So the process we go through in developing uh, what we call an expert panel process, looking at a process where we identify a need from the partnership. The partnership is interested in looking at different practice, what is the tech might be for reducing or controlling nitrogen, phosphorus, or sediments in the watershed. And so we basically go through a process of identifying what that might be. So it's starting at the work quality goal implementation team that Jeremy talked about as the head of the agriculture work group that I coordinate. And then basically coming down to the work group, and the work group is, is identifying and prioritizing its need within a long list 
that we usually have in questions, and generating and developing a panel that's going to be developing a report, a recommendation report. We hear more about that from our speakers coming up next about their, their experiences with, with working with these panels. But they're developing a recommendation based on science, research, published papers, great literature, et cetera, experiences of the, uh, the panel members. That's going into a partnership review process. So we have three groups in there. The sector work group itself, in this case, the agricultural work group, would be reviewing this recommendation. Another worship type of work group about data reporting, and any other relevant groups that I have an interest in uh, from the other parts of the, uh, the paper and partnership sectors. And finally, going to the work quality goal team for final approval, into the modeling teams. So it's a little bit like spaghetti out here, but it makes sense when you go through. We're just looking at some of the BMPs uh, practices that we've been working with here in the last year or two, developing recommendations. I'm going to sort of break these down into some examples of some areas, uh, production areas that would make sense here as far as the agriculture uh, arena. We're looking at crop land management practices, things like conservation tillage, Looking at crop residue management, a landscape, whether it's conventional till system with hardly any residue left, all the way up to uh, high residue minimum soil disturbance or no till system that we might know it as. So we have lots of variations of what management types might be there. Also, you might be looking at a variation of cover crops. It can take many very, very, very various forms, where it's looking at a traditional cover crop that you're terminating in the fall and spring and planting into a no-till situation perhaps. Or might be looking at a cover, commodity cover crop where you're limiting nutrient applications in the fall and raising it on in the spring to, for harvest either as forage or as for grain production. And another one here that's in the process right now is the cropland irrigation management panel. Looking at specifically on Del Mar, as far as what is the impact of, of supplementing natural rainfall with large irrigation systems in production and how that might or may not impact nature and production uh, in the big worship. So this is a continuous process, and as soon as we're finishing up one panel, we're moving on to the next. And Mark, I think we might just need to skip the next yeah. couple slides. Sure. Because yeah, we are all chase here. I mean, there's point is that we've got some panels that have already been done and uh, ones that are coming up. If you have any specific questions on any of the particular panels, talk to Mark and I. So we, you can see we have some additional ones coming up. As far as results from these, uh, you're looking at, we've added nine new species of cover crops, either as in, individual species or mixtures, for example, on that. Uh, we've added in nutrient management. We've redefined what the management entry level is. It's no longer based on a plan. It's based on a set of management practices. That's a departure of what we've done in the past. And we also aligned it with the four R practices in that as well for looking at supplemental nutrient management practices. The last one here is mineral treatment technologies. Jeremy has been the bottom of that. Looking at six categories. We'll hear about that from Doug. Yep. We'll hear more about that later. And as far as lessons learned, so this is sort of a joint with Jeremy and myself. But Jeremy, you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, I think we'll try to make this quick here. Um, a lot of these are common sense where these panels really depend on the chair and the coordinator to keep things moving along. Uh, we get a lot of great experts. Um, on these groups, so um, it, yeah, so they can really get some in-depth and awesome discussions going, but you gotta keep them on task. Um, and I think something that's worked out well is that we, panels were starting to balloon a little hard with like, we were trying to get someone from each state that, from, that works with their program on every panel. We're, we're ending up with groups that are like, a dozen or 20 people, and now we've shaped it down to like six to ten, so you can work much more effectively. Uh, and having someone from the USDA involved has been very beneficial as well. <coughs> as far as looking ahead, you know, this process itself is always evolving um, as far as how we operate the panels, what they're looking for, and I think some things that the partnership really wants to start getting from not just the panels, but just to, to accompany the panel reports is, okay, well, what are the, the secondary benefits or consequences of these practices? Do they have habitat effects, fish impacts on fisheries, so forth? Panels are, are charged with focusing on the nutrients and sediment. 
but the decision makers care about more than that, obviously. Um, and the other one I'd highlight is the communicating uncertainty. Um, you know, some of these panels have dozens of studies to look at, others just have maybe three that were done in like the Northwest or at the Midwest. So as far as their applicability to the Chesapeake Bay, we're always using the professional judgment and doing the best we can, but sometimes what comes out at the end is just saying, you know, 40% reduction of phosphorus and nuclear nitrogen. And that's what people latch onto without understanding behind that is could be just a few studies or dozens of studies and in a few years, if there's been research that could change or could not change. So I think something that's uh, that's in the early stages is figuring out how we better communicate that so that people understand something is made more likely to change or based on more science than other practices. So that can factor into their decision making. Mark, anything else? Uh, now that we've covered it, and so, sorry, we ran a little late. Well, we started a little late, so if anybody has a question or two, please ask them, and we will go ahead and change over the slide. Maybe ask a question. Sure. Yes. Why was one of your lessons learned a limited state program member? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think. Uh, <laughs> one your, <laughs> well, one thing about the process, uh, the way it actually plays out, is you get input from the states fairly regularly, and you communicate with them on. Daily, usually monthly basis. So we get their input a lot as it is. I mean, who to go to if we have questions. So their input is still definitely factored in. And um, what we're looking at is trying to keep it to a manual group size as far as the people that we communicate scheduling meetings or we do keep it manual. So what are you looking at here? You want a science based panel, not a program based panel. If you want a panel that's going to give you a value for six days, my little panel that's big somewhere else. Program. It's not going to work in Virginia. Right. But those agencies all sit on the review process and provide feedback into the panel. The panel basically takes that into their development recommendations. So if, in order to keep, we have panels that were 23 members bid. That's huge. Who doesn't want it? And so you've got to have a panel that's very focused on the science, coming with a science based focus out to the, the partnership to the state and the federal agencies to get that input and then have a product. Okay. All right, we're going to uh, have lots of time for discussion as we move through the evening. These guys are going to stay here all week. <laughs>